good morning, good afternoon, and good evening, folks. Welcome to another episode of the Marketing Your Practice podcast. Today's guest is Mike Crass from MKG Marketing, and I'm talking with Mike today all about digital agencies. One of the things I hear all the time from talking to you guys and with my coaching clients at all is the frustration, the overwhelm that comes from two things. I don't have time to do my marketing or I can't get my head around some of the technology challenges from uh, boosting my posts to Facebook marketing, YouTube, content creation, all those kind of things there too. This often ends up with either us reaching out to digital agencies or if you're anything like me, I have digital agencies reaching out to me each and every week telling me that they can solve all of my problems. So what I wanted to talk with Mike about today is that what should we be using a digital agency? Should we be kind of offloading our marketing onto somebody else? And if we're going to do that, what should we be looking for? So Mike introduced me to this concept of a request for proposal. So in that, we should be talking to them about how much we want to spend, what results should we be looking for as well. I also had a really interesting, I was interested in this, one of the questions I asked Mike is, how long should it take for us to start to see results? This is very much like the conversation that we have with our patients all the time. They're reaching out to us with problems, health problems. They come to us saying, hey, listen, I want my health better tomorrow, my back, my headache, my migraine, my fertility issues, but often it takes time. The same is true when working with a digital agency as, as well. And interesting, you know, Mike said, we probably shouldn't be expecting results really in the first 90 days as well. We had an interesting discussion about what a really great relationship looks like. Often in these kind of relationships, we want to abdicate responsibility all onto them. Say, hey, listen, you manage my marketing, you do it, uh, just send me the patients. It doesn't work, it hasn't worked in the past, it's not likely to work in the future. It's a partnership as well. So if you're thinking about or interested in working with a marketing agency, then this is a really great episode for you to look, uh, listen to because it will take you through the interview techniques, what questions to ask, uh, you'll get introduced to this concept of a request for a proposal. In fact, in the show notes, I'll have a link to a sample one of those as well. Mike is a hell of a nice guy. This episode is will take you step by step through what you should expect to find in an agency um, and how to go about working with one that'll help you and your business get great results in the short term and the long term as well. Let's go and chat with Mike. Welcome to the Marketing Your Practice podcast, where we guide natural health and wellness experts through the pitfalls of marketing. Each episode, you'll learn simple, effective, easily actionable and heart-centered marketing strategies. And here's your host, Angus Pike. Mike Grass, welcome to the Marketing Your Practice podcast. How are you? I'm doing well. Thank you for inviting me to the stage with you. It is a pleasure. Now, I want to start off with this. I want you to tell me a little bit about what it's like flying your 1981 Cessna 182. How long have you been doing that for? Well, that, uh, that plane is a, a new blessing in my life that came last fall. Yes. And uh, before that, I'd been flying a, a Cessna 172, which is like the little brother of the 182, just a little less muscle, a little more wiry, you know, kind of mean in a fight, but still very capable. Now, are you, yeah. telling, are, are you telling me that your COVID purchase was an aeroplane? It didn't. Well, I guess the answer is yes. Uh, it was an airplane and golf clubs. Those are the two things I've bought in the past year. <laughs> yeah, I like it. That that really beats the three pairs of sneakers that I bought with my um, COVID uh, purchase as well. Is there any stress about flying a plane that's, you know, 40 years old as well? Does it fly just as well as a new one? What What's the deal with that? Yeah, I mean, uh, aeronautically, those airplanes are just as safe, if not safer than anything that's been produced in the past couple of years. Uh, you know, a lot of that design work by, uh, by Cessna, which is, you know, an American based uh, aerospace company has, you know, really lived up through the test of time. So 1981 for context, you know, it's what 40 years old roughly. Um, but I, I've flown in planes that were built in the late fifties, you know, 1950s, and those are still very airworthy, and they get, you know, they get inspected. It's called an annual inspection. They pull the airplane apart entirely every 12 months, and then they put it back together. And they is a uh, qualified mechanic. So there's actually probably more mechanics looking at my airplane than mechanics looking at a Boeing uh, 737 or an Airbus that you might be flying on from, you know, Sydney to Perth or wherever you're flying to and from. <laughs> Beautiful. Well, before our, uh, our audience starts to get worried that we're going to talk about airplanes the whole time, we're going to jump in. We're going to have a talk today 
um, all about kind of digital marketing agencies, which is your area of expertise. You've built a really successful um, agency over the years as well. Can you give our audience a little bit of your background journey in terms of what brought you to where you are right now? Sure. So, you know, I, I went to college or university and I wanted to be a writer and uh, specifically a sports writer. So this is, you know, many years ago. And my best friend's father, you know, he asked me a really good question. Speaking of Boeing, he used to work for Boeing. Yeah. And uh, he said, do you want to eat hot dogs in a minor league baseball stadium in Nowheresville, USA for the next 10 years? And he wasn't trying to be mean about it. He was just trying to provide some perspective of, you know, the sacrifice you're going to have to make to get in to be a sports writer, no matter if it's football, basketball, cricket, rugby, you know, whatever the sacrifice you're going to make is going to be pretty intense and nothing wrong with it if you don't want to make that, but, you know, really think about it. Mm. And so the more I thought about it, the more I realized, you know, I, my stomach doesn't agree with hot dogs that much. And apparently that was a, I had a steady stream of hot dogs or sausage uh, related sandwiches in my future with that yeah. uh, career path. So I started to look for other areas, um, that I could really take my communications degree and my interests in communications and get out there. And, and I ran into advertising, you know, and I, I call it, you know, big A advertising, because that's what you think of with like Madison Avenue, you know, the big offices and the beer kegs. And, you know, the first agency I worked at in Los Angeles, California, I actually did have a beer keg uh, and it was not frowned upon, you know, Mondays were kind of rough, but Tuesdays through Fridays, it was fair game. If it was lunch and you were grabbing, you know, your sandwich from the refrigerator, you just kind of hit really? that tap and yeah, yeah. had, a, had a, a little beer, not a big beer, of course. We're not irresponsible, but we had a little beer. That um, would be silly. And I, yeah. And uh, from there, you know, I, I started moving around a little bit. I left California, moved back to Seattle, where I'm originally from, where I grew up. And uh, I met my business partner and we realized that what we really loved about marketing was the digital marketing space. We mm -hmm. love to be able to track everything. You know, you, you invest something, you know, a dollar here and to be able to track the return on investment of that dollar on the other end of your uh, investment machine was really interesting to us. And it's, it's not to say that with traditional media, you know, television, billboards, you know, sporting events, you know, that kind of uh, sponsorship activity that you couldn't track that is just a little bit more difficult. Mm. And so what we wanted to do was we wanted to be able to look our clients in the eyes and say, you know what, we spent a dollar, here's what we got back for, for that dollar. And if it was a positive number, that conversation was very easy. It was, you know, you spent a dollar, we brought you two back, how many dollars can you spare, you know, for these kind of marketing demand oriented programs? Because mm -hmm. if you're trying to scale this business, you know, we've, we've got a clear path to scale for you here, whether that's a direct to consumer sale, right? You spend the dollar and then on your website, they, they end up purchasing $2 worth of something, or whether it's, you spend a dollar, it goes to your sales staff who then picks up that lead and starts, you know, working it from there. Um, and I know that you've got listeners of businesses of all different sizes, um, that sales staff could be the owner. It could be an actual sales staff. You know, it's, it's whoever answers those sales conversations. Mm -hmm. um, so that's a, a little bit of my background, you know, from, uh, you know, American baseball to uh, food that's not very good for you to thinking about, you know, wh where would I want to go and, and what's meaningful to me? And, and if I were to summarize that journey, I'd say what's meaningful is I really like when people say, that was a good investment. And to know if it was a good investment, you have to know what you got out of it. Yeah. I feel like that's the ultimate outcome, <clears throat> excuse me, out of any business, whether it be that someone coming to one of my chiropractic practices as well, and you know, they hand over their 60 bucks for a visit there too. You want them to be at the end of it. And, and whilst they might not be able to say the actual monetary return in that situation, but ultimately they can go, that was a damn good investment. It, it, it feels really great. One of the hurdles that many of our listeners have with regards to getting into the digital marketing space, there's an overwhelm in time. I don't have time to be managing this. There's an overwhelm in the technology involved, which has many of them either reaching out to or being reached out to by digital marketing agencies. So let us help you with regards to this. Um, so first of all, why do you think that 
or, or do you think that small businesses, small to medium sized businesses, you know, are we best to be kind of partnering with a digital agency as, as well? Or should we be running it ourselves? Should we be employing somebody in? What's your thoughts on that? My initial thought, and I always share this with folks when I hear this question, is you should always try doing something yourself first mm. before you hire someone else. And, and notice that I didn't put a time on that. I didn't say do it for a year, do it for you know, five days, I just said, try it yourself. And the reason why is because if you're not very well versed, you don't consider yourself a subject matter in digital marketing, it'll be very difficult for you to scope out what you need and then mm -hmm. to evaluate who will best serve you on those needs if mm -hmm. you haven't tried it once yourself. And so even here with our agency, with MKG Marketing, we never outsource anything to an external partner until we've tried to do it ourselves. And to be frank, it actually probably speeds up the process of hiring that external partner because we try it for ourselves for a day or a week or a month and we realize how bad we are at it. <laughs> and we say, okay, we see the value if this was done right, but let's, let's, let's bring in a, an expert here, you know, that has the ability to really scale this for us and take it. I wouldn't call it to the next level. I would say even get out of bed, right? You know, sometimes we try things and using your, your uh, back pain uh, example, you know, we, we've got that back pain. We can't even get out of bed on this, on this idea. And it's yeah. like, okay, we know we can't get out of bed. We need a professional to help us. And so we always say, first up, do it yourself. Document where you get stuck. Document where you think is important. And it could be as simple as recording a little voice memo on your phone or just scribbling some notes on your notepad because that will help you create a, re a request for proposal, whether it's a very long formal RFP or whether it's just a one page, you know, here's what we're looking for and here's why we need it type uh, request. It, um, I love that answer. I, I know it, 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 it's gonna challenge some of our audience. I know in the joint ventures or the professional relationships I've had in the past, the ones where I've gone in to try and abdicate responsibility are the ones that have most often worked out really poorly for me. So when I've just kind of dumped a bunch of paperwork on an account and said deal with this without really knowing what my outcome was, if I have engaged over the years with many different advertising agencies without understanding the very basics of the language or you know those kind of things there too, they've often gone really poorly. So I, I like that idea of having at least a little bit of um, I always think that when we travel, you should probably learn how to say hello and goodbye and thank you, please. You know, the very basics, I think it's just respectful um, to do too. And I think when we're getting into an industry, whether we're wanting to be employing a, an agency, it's nice to be able to understand the very basics as well. So let's say that we have a play with it for a certain amount of time. And we realize that for whatever reason, that I, this is something that I actually want to um, uh, partner with somebody else. I want to employ a company to do this. Where, where do you start? Do I just jump on Google and look for digital marketing agency? When I'm, if I'm interviewing a company, what questions do I ask them? So if you were not knowing what you know now, if you were looking for a digital marketing agency, um, where would you begin? Sure. So I would begin with actually writing out that RFP or that brief, you know, put it down on paper. Yes. What are you looking for? Why do you think you need it? You know, what kind of parameters do they need to be aware of? And most importantly, what are the decision criteria? You know, what are your decision making criteria? How will you evaluate somebody uh, to figure out if they can help you out or not? Because these are questions that every single person you talk to, once you get to the sourcing part of this conversation, they're all going to ask you. So unless you are, you know, a true masochist and you enjoy having the same conversation 15 times in a row for a week, which I don't know many human beings that do, uh, you sort of lose steam after the first or second retelling of the same story. You're like, mm -hmm. okay, you know, whatever. You're, you're going to save yourself a lot of time and energy by saying, here is exactly what's important to us. Here's what we want you to show up with. And here's how we plan to make that decision. And then once you get into, you know, step one, like I just mentioned, is get that brief. And step two is now sourcing. Where, you, where will you find agencies? Yes. So I'm a big fan. Oh, go ahead. 
Yeah, I want to just backstep a couple. First of all, excuse my ignorance, you mentioned RFP before? Yeah, a uh, request for proposal. There we go. Beautiful. Okay. So that's, <laughs> there you go. That is telling me a little bit there in terms of where I am with regards to this too. What, and then on to this next idea, because you, you also introduced the concept of decision criteria. Um, can we just dive into a little bit more about that? Because I think people are going to say, well, look, my decision criteria is what kind of Mike mentioned at the start. I want to spend a dollar and I want you to give me back two. But I figured that we've probably got to ask for a little more than that. So what are some of the possible decision criteria that we could list? Or, or what are our expectations that would be reasonable for us to have as decision criteria? Yeah, so not only reasonable, but very appropriate decision criteria would be, you know, price, yes. which is different than how you charge. So price is the total number, right? It's, it's what you write a check for at the end of the yeah. month. How you charge is, do you do value-based pricing? Meaning you're going to scope out a set of activities with a, you know, a flat price. And I never pay more than that, right? Mm -hmm. There's a never exceed threshold mm -hmm. versus maybe an hourly rate. You know, there's a rate card, individual, uh, based on their experience, right? They might be more or less expensive on an hourly basis. So the, the how you charge is really important um, to understand from your agency. What are the um, what are the pluses and minuses of each of those? Because to me, immediately, I love the idea of there being a ceiling capped that I'm never going to go over this kind of spend. I can do that with my Facebook ads when I'm wanting to buy a lead. What are, right. what are the, why would I choose one versus the others? What's the up and down side of each of those? So with value-based pricing, you have that never exceeds ceiling. The, the first that you just already keyed on, first benefit is we're not going to go over this without having a conversation, mm. right? Or even when we're approaching going over this, it's up to us as the agency to pick up the phone and say, hey, we're kind of running a little, we call it running hot. We're running a little hot this month. Yeah. Um, we just want you to be aware of that. So that's that constant, that fixed pricing is really important. Um, the other benefit of that value-based pricing is if you really believe that and you trust that they are going to take care of you, that agency that is, mm. then, you know, the year is 2021. It's it, the question I pose there for value-based pricing is, do you care if we make you $2 in a minute or an hour or 10 hours per month? Mm. You know, are, are you willing to say, as an agency, are you willing to stand by, this could take me 10 hours to get done or 10 minutes, but either way, we are driving towards the goals that we've agreed to. Um, and to me, you know, just personally speaking, I don't really care if it takes you 10 minutes or 10 hours. Mm. Um, it's kind of like that old, here in the US, there's this old, uh, this old joke about plumbers. Um, you know, you hire a plumber because your sink is stopped up, you show up, the plumber shows up and says, oh, you know, you just crank this, turns it open. That'll be $100. $100? You were here for two seconds. Well, it's $95 to know which, uh, you know, screw to turn and then $5 to turn the screw. And if you had known that, you wouldn't have had to call me. <laughs> yeah. So those are kind of the benefits of that value-based pricing. On an hourly basis, um, the, the benefit there is if you have a lot of varying workloads. Yes. So say that it's uh, you're in a seasonal business um, or you experience extreme seasonality for whatever reason. Okay, I don't really want to pay you the same amount of money every single month in January when we're completely dead, right? Like we might even be closed mm -hmm. down, you know, if mm -hmm. it's a restaurant, so to uh, for example. But a restaurant in August, you know, right on the beach is going to be so busy. We're not going to know what to do with all this business. And you are going to be so busy as our, busy as our agency. You're not going to even have any, like, you're going to be just running as fast as possible. So that variance helps to offset, you know, not having that constant, um, that fixed price per month. And what a lot of hourly billing contracts look like is that they will establish a good one and what I would recommend to your listeners is to establish a ceiling. So yes, we're willing to pay this rate card up to, call it, I'm just making it up a number, you know, $10,000 a month. And at the $8,000 mark each month, we need, we need a check-in, either email, text message, phone call, Zoom meeting, 
smoke signals, you know, however you want to communicate mm -hmm. with us, there, there's this predetermined check mark just to make sure that we're on track, right? If it's the beginning of the month and I get a call from you that we're at 80% of our hours for the month, that's a problem. Yes. Um, and I, I need to understand why that happened and, and make a decision on what we're going to do. So those are just a few of the, the pros. I, I suppose that the cons become the opposite of those, you know, yeah. even, even with a, on the hourly basis with a fixed uh, ceiling that you ask for, it's still possible that they might be so busy that they go over it in a week and they realize it after. Now you have an overage and that's a really uncomfortable business conversation, a necessary one to have, but uncomfortable. Mm. I know lots of the agencies that I've worked firsthand and spoken with too, that there often is this concept of a monthly retainer. And I guess to an extent, that's that value-based ceiling that says, look, you know, it's going to cost you a thousand bucks for us to work with you each month. I'm not really concerned about, and as you mentioned beforehand, if you're sending me the business, you know, I hope for you it takes you two minutes rather than two days. But as long as I'm getting the business, I don't really care as well. And so that concept of a kind of monthly retainer would be perhaps another way of looking at that kind of value-based sort of ceiling. We're going to do this work for you. We're not negotiating necessarily on how many hours that's going to take, but that's this is the monthly spend that you're going to have with us. Is that another way that's commonly kind of articulated? Correct. And retainers work well when you've got a very clear set of needs, right? We need you to, every month, we need you to uh, build out creative for our Facebook page and then run Facebook and Instagram ads. And, you know, then we need your, your help with copywriting for our email marketing and marketing automation um, for whatever CRM we're using. When you have those clear activities, the retainer works great. And I, I know that sometimes people get worried because we operate primarily on a retainer basis. They hear mm -hmm. retainer and they think this, this lock in, right? Like, you know, they've got these handcuffs and it's, you know, they're going to go the full, the full mm -hmm. duration of the retainer. Mm -hmm. Frankly, that's, that's not the case. You know, most retainer based contracts for agencies will have either a 30, a 60 or a 90 day out clause. Mm -hmm. So you could sign a, a 12 month contract get a few months into it and just realize, hey, this isn't working. You know, we, it's just not working, you know, nothing against you or us. We're just, we're not vibing. Mm -hmm. So we're going to, you know, trigger that clause so that we can wrap up our work together and our company can go find someone else that will help us. So I, that's just my perspective. I, I think the word retainer kind of makes it sound scary. It's almost like this legal retainer where you, yes. you drop down, you know, a hundred thousand and, you know, they chip away at it and then they tell you when you're out of money and then you, have to find a hundred thousand dollars from somewhere else and do it again and it, it's really not like that most retainers have those out clauses and they tend to allow you to to bill and pay in the same month so uh, you know february 1st the bill goes out it's due by the end of february it's done then mike tell me this what is for you as an agency and i guess this is kind of a reverse way of asking the question what does a great client look like and I, the flip side of that is what what should i expect i've gone through i've kind of written out my request for a proposal I've got really clear, I've come down to three different companies, I've chosen one and whatever way we're moving forwards. How do I be a great client for you? How much should I be involved in that process going forwards? And does that differ in the first few months versus what might be happening six or 12 months down the track? Yeah, the first few months is always a lot more intense. There's more meetings, there's more getting to know each other. You're, you're bringing the right stakeholders to the table in terms of workflows and capabilities, you know, who approves certain things using the example of, uh, you know, Facebook creative. Mm. It, does this need to go through a committee for approval? Do we need to run it through a project management system? Or can I send you an email and then you just give me a thumbs up, a thumbs down or somewhere in the middle, which I'm not sure what the middle would be. But anyways, mm. um, you know, what, what does that workflow look like? So it tends to be I would say the first 90 days are the busiest time of working together between an agency and a company. And in fact, here at MKG, we tend to break things down into 30, 90, and 365. So in the first 30 days, how much progress can we make together? Hmm. First 90 days, how much progress can we make together to set ourselves up for the rest of the year? And so what a, a good uh, client looks like, and I, I would actually rephrase that to, you know, what are good client behaviors? Yes. You know, good client behaviors for an agency are clarity around who's in charge of what. Yes. Uh, adding on to that, 
the owner of the business cannot be the approver of everything. It doesn't work. Yes. It never works. It never have. It never has. Um, maybe it will in the future, but historically, <laughs> you have way too much going on. You know, yeah. I know as a business owner, if it comes down between approving Facebook Creative from my agency or running payroll, I'm running payroll, and yeah. then I'm tired and I want to go home and see my kids or you know do something that's different. So uh, the owner can't be in charge of all the yeses. You have to split that up. And the other great client behavior is giving clear guidelines on how much, uh, in my own words, how much rope we have. You know, do we need everything to be described verbatim to us? And you want to kind of direct us. That's called more of a client directed relationship where you have uh, incredible control. There's nothing wrong with that control, but it's important that you, to you as as the client, that things are done a certain way and that they're messaged a certain way. And you know, nothing wrong with client directed. I just need to know: is this going to be one of those relationships? So, you know, when I I put those three together, it's really a conversation around expectations and approvals. Um, and last but not least, I would say a great client behavior is setting a good meeting rhythm. Mm. So at the beginning, we're going to meet a lot. Some will be planned. Some will be, you're just going to call me in the morning and say, can I grab 30 minutes in your afternoon? And, you know, let, let's get, let's get into something. I need to talk a little bit more. The meeting rhythm is really important because when I see client and agency relationships begin to unravel, it's usually because they're not communicating enough. That's not unique to client's and agencies, it's more unique to human beings, right? When relationships are unraveling, either you're not hearing each other clearly and you are talking a lot, which is a problem in and of itself, or you just don't have that, that good rhythm. So with our clients, we like to meet at least every other week for a longer meeting, you know, like a, an hour long meeting to make sure that we're doing project updates, to make sure that they know the status of certain things so that they can educate us, you know, our us as the agency on new things that might be happening within their company. Mm -hmm. And that rhythm becomes really important. Once you lose that, it becomes hard to kind of get back into the flow. It's mentally this meeting that was on your calendar, then it fell off. And now you're kind of, as the client, I, I see our clients who do that kind of debate to put it back on like, well, I think we could probably survive without it, right? It's like, well, a lot of things can survive without oxygen for a while, but eventually you've got to breathe some life into this relationship. And that can come from both sides too. Sometimes agencies can be the ones who try and get rid of all these meetings so they can be more efficient. But those meetings are where you really have an opportunity to dive deep on different topics and learn you know, what's happening with them and how you can help them out. Yeah. One of the um, contradictions I see all the time with uh, lots of the practitioners I deal with is that we get frustrated that patients come in to us that have had sometimes 10 and 20 years of a problem and then they want it fixed today. Like today's adjustment, can you do that now and fix me? And uh, so we, we complain about that. And then when we want our marketing, we end up going to you guys saying the thing, like I want new patients tomorrow. So that being said, and I know this is a very general question. If the goal was ultimately for me to spend a dollar and then for me to get at least a dollar back, hopefully a little bit more for the, that return on investment to go positive, what's the average time frame? How long should I give you to do that? When would I know that hey, this relationship just ain't working? I need to go and look elsewhere. Yeah, so we always say that to figure that economic metric out of you know what makes your business not just run but thrive mm. it can take about a year right the big checkpoints that we generally talk to our clients about are in three month or 90 day increments so it's day 90 day 180 day 270 around the 180 to 270 day range of working with somebody you know so that's six to nine months you should have a pretty good idea if we're moving in the right direction or not and the reason why it, it can take that long is because number one, the first few months are, uh, if you'll allow the analogy, it's kind of building the house together, right? So we're framing, we're pouring concrete and foundations and and you wanna make sure you, you pour a solid foundation before you build you know, a 80 story skyscraper on top of that thing. So there's a lot of foundation happening right there. 
What what might that what might that look like? Can you give me an example? Perhaps obviously it doesn't need to be a healthcare business, but of a small business or a brick and mortar business. What does that laying the foundations look like? What kind of content are you creating? What are you trying to find out um, during that time? Yeah, a yeah, lot of what we're trying to find out is, is with our, our clients, clients what, what who is who buying from you and what do they look like? Mm-hmm. So we here at MKG, we don't invest a ton of time and energy into building these in-depth user personas down to, uh, you know, Jennifer, Jennifer likes to eat this kind of cereal, cereal but she only eats it between 6 and 6.30 a.m. That's a little bit too much for us. Mm. We want to know the user persona in terms of how do they come to you. For the example of a chiropractor, how far will they come away from to come to you? Yes. Right. Like, What's, what's, what's your radius there in terms of how far, how, how bad is the pain before they say, eh, this might be an inferior doctor or clinic or practice, but... I honestly just can't, I can't do that drive. <laughs> and, yeah. and in some cases, they might literally not be able to do that drive, right? They just say, I can't do it. Yes. So um, we like to know in those, those first 30 days, who are we talking to? How are they making decisions? What are triggers, right? What are either immediate or long-term triggers that will get them to look for something like you? Yeah. And once you start to understand those, we can say, okay, Let's look at it from a content standpoint. What kind of content do we have around these triggers, right? You know, an an entire example with the chiropractor uh, practice could be how far will they drive? Yes. And, and, you know, I know pain is often measured on a scale of one to 10. Yeah. Um, So at what number will they not come to you if it's more than uh, 50 kilometers away, for example? Yeah. And that kind of tells you, these are the pockets we need to live in. Uh, additionally, it could be, we're, we're talking in a lot of these examples from the persona of the patient. It could be a caregiver, whether it's a parent taking care of a child, mm. a child taking care of an aging parent who's now got some problems and they need to be looked at. I'm, I'm not sure about the family members in your life. I definitely have got some stubborn ones who say, no, no, I'll, I'll be okay tomorrow. And mm. surprisingly, is never okay tomorrow, right? Because yes. they never treated the underlying problem. <laughs> yeah. So we, in those, that initial 30, 60 days, we want to know how do they make decisions? Who are these people? You know, broadly, just paint a broad picture yeah. of these individuals. And then what kind of content do they need to make decisions? And how do they want that content delivered to them? right? Is this a, going back to my plumber example earlier, um, is this a, when you have a, a plumbing problem, it's immediate, Yes. right? It's like you go to Google or Nextdoor or Angie's List or whatever website that brings plumbers together. And it's honestly like the first plumber that answers that doesn't sound like a lunatic is coming to your house. Like that's the answer is like, you've got toilet problems, you've got stuff you know, water coming out of the side of your house or in front of the house, like the first reasonable human being is coming. End of story. (laughs) So that sense of urgency is important. On the other hand, it could be, again, we'll stick with the chiropractor example. It could be just, you know, a little disc problem. And and you've got some special things in your desk chair that kind of help. They don't solve the underlying cause, but they kind of help alleviate the pain. Mm. Um, And by things I'm not talking about like uh, prescriptions. I mean more, you know, like little things that you'd roll around on your back or whatever. Yes. Um, so how long will that individual research, right? She's not going to be the first person that answers is coming. She's going to be, well, I can kind of survive with it now. And, mm. you know, it's, it's maybe my lower back and I'm, I'm not super comfortable having a whole bunch of strangers, you know, ask me to take my shirt off and jam their fingers into my lower back. So I'm, I'm much more comfortable. So I'm going to consume more content yes. and I'm going to have more patience to figure out who the right person is for me. And so you just kind of need to understand how those personas think at a high level and then align content to them. And then how do we get the content out there, right? Is it ads? Is it posted on our website? Is it posted on YouTube or social media? Um, is it SMS, right? You know, you think about individuals who are ready to go really right now, right? They have a pain level of seven, eight, nine, ten. You can probably get them to talk to you over their phones, right? Like yeah. on text, on SMS. And so you have to think about what is that medium of which you'll deliver 
this information to them and that content so that they can make a decision. So that's kind of how we start to think about it in the first 30, 60, 90 days is who's making that decision? What do they need to make the decision? And how do we get this information in front of them? Mm. Would it be fair to say in terms of if we were to use a fishing metaphor, that first kind of 30 to 90 days is really finding out what bait works best and perhaps what time of the day the fish are biting. It's that kind of investigation at that stage. Absolutely. You know, you take another uh, business and you might think about like recruiting, right? Recruiting is always my go-to example. Yes. Do you want to send, do you want to place phone calls, text messages and send emails to people who already have jobs about recruiting them to another company yes. between the hours of nine and five? Probably not. You can send the messages, but if they're, if they're aware of the fact that, you know, being at the office, like all their network traffic is monitored, well, they're probably going to know that they shouldn't open that email or that text message because then, you know, their bosses or IT can see, oh, yeah. shoot, you know, like they know I'm looking for a job. Yeah, I love it. One of the things I noticed in kind of reading through a lot of your work is some of this focus on the difference between a growth and a fixed mindset. Um, some of Carol Dweck's work. Where, where does that fit into my relationship with you as a digital uh, marketing agency? And why is it important that both of us um, have that growth mindset? Yeah, so I'm glad you brought that up. And when I think about a growth mindset with an agency client relationship, you know, what I'm really summarizing and boiling that down to is how much are you willing to invest to grow? And I don't just mean money, like capital. Yes. I also mean how much time, how much of your institutional knowledge as the owner of this business are you willing to share with me? I, I really look at it that way um, from the client agency relationship. The other thing that I look at is, and this is just me being completely honest, um, from a growth mindset, there is more business out there right now than MKG, my agency, could ever service in a day, maybe even a lifetime. Yes. So from a, a, a growth mindset is also one of abundance, right? Yes. There, there is that out there. And because of that, if we run into client relationships that aren't working, either we learn it early on or maybe it takes us a while to figure it out, it's really important to have one or both parties you know, have that courage to be transparent and say, I'm going to raise my hand and just, this isn't me firing you. It's just me saying, I don't really think this is working. I'd like to talk about it. Mm. Um, and it's okay with that, that growth and abundance mindset because uh, as somebody told me the other day, when you let something go, you know, you open your hands, mm. you open your hands to bring something back in. Mm. And if it's a fixed mindset, you know, as an agency, I'm just thinking, oh my gosh, like I'm, I'm going to lose $50,000 in revenue per year. And holy cow, this is going to get my whole growth plan off track and da, 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 da. And it's really like, I'm going to let this client go or they're going to let me go. And it's going to open me up to a new opportunity that's probably a better fit. It doesn't mean it's going to be easy. In fact, the, the interim time is usually not easy at all. Mm. But it does mean that it's important to kind of be on the same wavelength there between client and agency. Yeah. I, I love that concept in there too, Mike. And it, it reminds me of what you said before about really open lines of communication. I had um, a, a number of years ago, there's a coach who I was working with and it was interesting, I was getting frustrated with some of the results of how our relationship was working. I would, um, I would send him an email asking for some directions on some things, and often it would come back with a one or two sentence response. I wasn't kind of happy with that. It was, took time to come back to me. And we got to the end of our relationship in terms of our time commitment relationship and due for me to sign up again. And I said, look, this is not working for me. Every time I kind of ask you a question, I get these kind of short answers and they take time to come back to. So I don't think I'll continue on. And it was interesting because his response to me at that stage there was, I wish you had have told me that I, I could have fixed that. I felt frustrated because inherently the guy was great. I knew I wasn't getting the best out of him, but I was also being a really lousy client as well that, it, you know, and having the ability to be able to communicate back to somebody, um, even whether it be our personal trainer that we work with as a family to say, well, this is the, we, I know that we don't like these style of workouts. So as opposed to saying, I'm going to get a new personal trainer. Well, how about we start with communicating with them first? Look, we don't like it when we do these ones here. This is kind of what works with us as a, as a family there too. And 
you know, that concept of open communication built on the foundation that we live in an abundant world where there's plenty of business for both of us and let's just spend our time um, doing all of that as well. Mike, thank you so much for today. I, I, you know, a lot of these questions today, I've, I've worked on and off with agencies. I do a lot of it myself there as well. So um, I, I was being selfish in asking a lot of these questions because I was interested in terms of the next time I go around this, maybe I should start with a request for a proposal. That would be a good spot for me to, um, to begin as well. In summing up a lot of what we've spoken about today, are there some final thoughts that you would like to give to, um, to our listeners with regards to their marketing, working with an agency, um, a, a lot of what we've talked about today? Yeah, I, I would sum it up with just kind of reiterating our, our kind of second half of our conversation of being very transparent and direct. And I would say that if something is not working, don't wait and get in front of it. It might be uncomfortable, and by might be, I mean it's going to be uncomfortable. Mm. Lean into that discomfort and have some frank conversations about what is or is not working. And that, that goes both ways. You know, I, I encourage all of our vendors here at MKG to do the same thing if something mm. is not working. I don't want to hear about it at the first contract renewal 13 months down the road. Yeah. I wanna hear it about it today so we can actually do something. And uh, I'll, I'll leave you with a story, I'll leave the listeners with a story that illustrates that. A friend of mine who is a few years older than me, a few decades older than me, very bright guy, built and sold a big agency uh, here in the West Coast of the United States. And he had McDonald's, a hamburger company, you know, as one of his clients. And I've never forgotten what he told me. They, they pulled him in to a meeting with the whole board of directors and they basically just berated him. You know, what, you're messing everything up and let me tell you about all the things you're doing wrong and da 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 da. And he's, he, you know, he, he took the stones being thrown at him and when everyone got all of it out, he said, who thinks that I showed up to this meeting today to feel like complete crap and like I was failing you? And, you know, raise your hands. No one raises their hands. He says, okay, I can commit to working on fixing everything that you've mentioned. I can't fix what I don't know exists as a problem. And so that's what I would leave the listeners with is don't let it go too long. Don't think, oh, it's just a thousand bucks a month. You know, I can deal with this next month. If it's a problem, it's a problem. And if it's made it out of your subconscious into your conscious mind and you're actually mm -hmm. thinking about it, it's probably been a problem for longer than you realized. Mm -hmm. So get in front of it. Be honest with your agencies. If they're not working, get rid of them and tell them exactly why. Yeah. And if they do the same thing to you and they say you're not working, demand that they say the same to you. Why are we not working so that we can go get another agency and not make the same mistake again? Yeah. Love it. Love it. Mike, beautiful words. Wise words too. Love that as well. Um, all the best. Enjoy the golf and the flying. Um, hopefully there's lots of that in the year coming ahead. Where's the best spot for our listeners to go? They want to find out a little bit more about kind of MKG marketing. Um, wh where should they go? We'll put all this in the show notes too. Definitely. So our website is MKG period marketing. That'll take us. Uh, that'll take you to our website. And then again, my name is Mike Crass. Uh, that's Crass with a K like karate. So you can look me up on LinkedIn. That's my most active social network everywhere else. I don't really follow that much. So come find me on LinkedIn. And last but not least, if you want to see an example of decision making criteria, I've got a few great examples. Um, that I'm happy to share with your listeners so that they could literally just kind of drag and drop into their own RFPs as they look for an agency. Yeah, fantastic. I'll work out how to perhaps link to those in the show notes and the website that kind of goes with this as, as well. But that's super generous. That'd be um, very helpful. Mike, thank you. Thank you. If you enjoyed listening to this podcast, you have to come and check out the Community Influencer Program. It's my monthly coaching program where we take all this material and I'll work one-on-one -on -one with you to apply, implement, systematize, and help guide you and your practice to the next level. Now you can join me on over at adiomedia.com forward slash join. That's adiomedia.com forward slash join. I'd love to see you in there.